Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. Lebanon just can't catch a break. The Saudis just went bananas over comments criticizing the war in Yemen by Lebanon's Minister of Information from before he was minister. The Saudis have gone nuclear over this, trying to bring down the newly formed Lebanese government and bullying other Arab states to gang up on a small country teetering on the brink of collapse. All this amidst the worst economic disaster in the modern era, never-ending political crises, and medicine, fuel, and water shortages. To make matters worse, October saw clashes in Beirut on a front line that dates back to the Civil War of the 1980s, with a Christian militia notorious from that war firing at Shia protesters affiliated with a Shia party and militia also from that war. This was caused by the dispute over an attempt to politicize the investigation over last year's port explosion. Why is all this happening now? Does it have anything to do with the Lebanese civil war? What was that war even about? And how does it relate to the foreign meddling wreaking havoc on Lebanon today? Here to put it all in its historical context is Assad Abu Khalil, a professor of political science at California State University, a prolific writer, and the original angry Arab. Welcome, Assad. Hi. <laughs> so a quick note to listeners and viewers, I had a long discussion with Assad about the origins of the Lebanese Civil War and how it relates to many of Lebanon's problems today. And we're going to get to that interview. But we actually had that discussion a few days before the uh, Saudi Arabia threw its big temper tantrum. So right. I've invited I've invited Assad back on for a second time to just very quickly address that and give his thoughts on this huge development before we go to the original interview, which will come right after this. So Assad, thank you for coming back and giving us uh, some more of your <laughs> giving us some more of your very invaluable time and your invaluable take on on what just transpired. So just to summarize, very quickly for those who are watching. Uh, Basically what happened, Georges Khardahi, who is the information minister of Lebanon, he made some remarks against the war on Yemen, calling it futile. And he said that the Houthis were defending themselves. And this was before he became information minister. The Saudis seemed to have dug this up as a pretext to launch this assault on Lebanon as its economy is collapsing. And they've now severed diplomatic and economic ties with Lebanon and uh, they've done this along with their allies, Bahrain, the UAE, and Kuwait. And so this is all just to say that, um, you know, as I see it, Assad, it seems as though a bunch of regional dictatorships who are aligned with the U.S., as we know, are punishing Lebanon as part of this broader hybrid war on the country for being home to the region's most significant forces of resistance to imperialism. And, you know, the response, and I've seen you commenting on this, the response by many Lebanese media figures and activists just bowing down really to this Saudi violation of, of Lebanon's sovereignty has been just completely shameful and embarrassing to watch. So given all that, you know, what's your response to, to these recent events? And why do you think the Saudis are doing this now? You're absolutely right. Uh, this is not about this one man. It's not about Qardahi, and I'm no fan of this man. He is like most media and entertainment personalities in Lebanon, fans of Arab tyrants. He has praised them all from Syria to Egypt to all the Gulf countries and so on. This is about our freedom of speech. And this is why this matter to me is one of the most significant and it's being lost and forfeited by key personalities of journalism and civic society. And what is so ironic about all this, Rania, is, and you've been in Lebanon for a while, <clears throat> is that the people who shouted the loudest about revolution, about sovereignty, about our freedoms, are the ones <clears throat> who have been very mum or have, in fact, joined the chorus to condemn somebody for their freedom to express their views. And this man, Kordahi, made those statements before he was appointed minister. So they do not apply to his time in the cabinet. This is about Saudi Arabia, has been for many years launching a war against Lebanon to bring it to its knees. To me, it's all about the July war of 2006. It's all about that. Lebanon was able to bring Israel to its knees. Israel has never recovered. The humiliation over 33 days is something that Israel cannot recover from. Now it has assembled this alliance of the region of Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel. <coughs> And as you said, they want to punish Lebanon because Lebanon humiliated Israel. 
It's all about that. They basically want Lebanon to surrender to them and to Israel. And this is why I have been saying in Arabic for the last few days, this is not about Hezbollah. This is not about Iran. This is not about Saudi Arabia. And you know me, I'm no fan of any regimes in the region or on earth. Uh, but but this is about a basic right for us to be able to vocalize our criticism of one of the most cruel war of Yemen. Yemen is an Arab country. Those people who have been enemies of Arabism for decades, those are the people who aborted and foiled all attempts at Arab unity since the 1950s. Those are the people who undermine the true Arab nations project of Nasser and others are now speaking in the name of Arabism. Their Arabism is Zionism. Their Islam is Zionism. And they try to basically pressure all Arab governments and all Arab people to become uh, to become their subservience. And this is something that many Lebanese and many Arabs refuse. I have been hearing from a lot of Arabs in the Gulf, especially, who disagree with what's happening. This is this is, but this is a, this is part of a series of measures by the Saudi government. Saudi Arabia, with very little uproar in the Arab world, in the in the Western world, especially in their media, kidnapped the Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Al Hariri. They tortured him and they forced him to read a statement, a statement which was intended to spark a civil war in Lebanon. Those are the same people. This is the man who has been conspiring with Israel to undermine. Uh, resistance against Israel. And their record in Lebanon is very long. I mean, later we speak about their role in the civil war. Let us mm -hmm. not forget in 1985, Saudi Arabia, the American government and the Israelis worked together to plant a car bomb in one of the most crowded areas of Lebanon, the southern suburb, because they wanted to kill one man who they accused of being a Hezbollah leader, Sheikh Mohammed Hussein Fadlullah, and he was not leader of Hezbollah. And they did not manage to kill him, but they killed tens, over 80 people, if I'm not mistaken, killed, and uh, hundreds were injured and so on. I mean, that's the record of Saudi Arabia. And today, they took the opportunity at a time when Lebanon, since its history, is at its weakest. Its economy is in shambles. Uh, starvation is on the door. Uh, and also, uh, something like the poverty rate is around 60-70% of Lebanese families today. And they chose this time of suffering in order to squeeze the screws on the Lebanese people. And this is something what America does, right? America does it against Venezuela, America does it against Iran, America does it against Cuba. I mean, they are learning from their masters. And this Biden administration, which the Western media were telling us, it's going to be a contrast to the Trump administration, is following in the footsteps of Trump in prostrating to these Gulf despot. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden, not Donald Trump, has been sending one envoy after the other to Mohammed bin Salman in order to get his approval and to ingratiate himself with him. And this same government of Saudi regime and the UAE regime, let us not forget, has one of the closest alliances with Israel in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Those regimes are squeezing Lebanon. So are we naive to dismiss the involvement of Israel in this conspiracy? And it is a conspiracy. And let us remember, Arania, you and I have been saying on the Lebanese case that let us not dismiss the outside role, external intervention. And you know, these Lebanese school, westernized uh, uh, groups, civic groups, the Sao Sao, you know, and they've been saying, no, no, it's entirely internal. Nobody interferes in Lebanese affairs. You have a foreign government asking the Lebanese people to muzzle the Lebanese people and to fire a minister because he dared say, that this war in Yemen was pointless, which is something that has been said uh, by many Lebanese politicians, including Walid Jumblak and Nabih Berri, the Speaker of Parliament. But of course, they won't dare go ag after them. They go against somebody who doesn't have a big party behind them, like George Kardahi. <sighs> Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. And I think that the point that you make about the dismissal of the outside role played by the U.S., the Saudis, the Israelis, by everyone in Lebanon uh, is really a product of a lot of this discourse that we talk about later in this interview that's coming from a Western funded, Saudi funded, Gulf funded NGOs and civil society groups that really want to take everything wrong with Lebanon. And there is a lot wrong with Lebanon. Internally, especially, of course, right, but they right. want to dis—they want to dismiss the role that imperialism essentially plays in that, because all of that corruption inside Lebanon, all of the problems, the weak state, and we you know one last thing I'll mention is 
when we're talking about Saudi Arabia specifically, I mean, one of the reasons Lebanon has this sect sectarian system that was implemented after that was implemented to end the civil war, Saudi Arabia played a huge role in doing no that, doubt. No as doubt. well as the U.S. and all these other players. So the state no of Lebanon is weak because of the outside, and you can't really address the problems internally in the country in a way that's going to be effective until you get rid of that outside influence. And so that's why it's so important for this Western discourse to dismiss that so you don't look at the real culprit, which is and, imperialism. And, I mean, I know our time is limited. I just want to conclude by saying one of the most shameful aspects of this affair has been the behavior of many Lebanese journalists and media people, not only the one who are in Dubai based, but the ones in Beirut as well. Those people have been basically supporting the right of a foreign government to muzzle our freedom of expression. It has become so desperate and pathetic on the part of these personalities. that one of those Lebanese journalists uh, who works for a Saudi conglomerate actually called for Gulf governments to expel those Lebanese who live among them, who are not loyal and subservient like, like him. I mean, that's so absurd. I mean, you have the Lebanese are providing the Saudi and the UAE government with the ammunition to basically crack down against uh, the presence, the existence of Lebanese who live and make their living in the Gulf. And the Saudi and the UAE government in their discourse, they treat those Lebanese immigrants as if they are hostages. They keep mm -hmm. threatening to expel them. Saudi Arabia, your viewers should know, Saudi Arabia since the 1960s has been threatening. If you don't know, if you don't do what we tell you, we will expel those Lebanese who live and work here. As if those Lebanese are living off the charity of the Saudi royal family. These are hardworking Lebanese who earn their living, just as we live in America and we earn our living. I am not living here of the charity of the US government. I earn my own living and I pay my own taxes. That applies to the Lebanese who work in those Gulf governments. But they don't want people to be free. These people want slaves. They want the Lebanese political, because they have been used to that. The Lebanese mm -hmm. political class and the banking class and the security agencies have acted like slaves to the Saudi and the UAE government. That's in their behavior. It's unfortunate, but they have polluted our culture to get to the point where journalists who work for Saudi and UAE media and for European media, as you mentioned also, because some of these websites that you know about who are funded by Soros and European uh, megaphone. sources. <laughs> megaphone. And many <laughs> others. I mean, yeah. imagine those people are either silent, not saying a word against this uh, encroachment on our freedom of speech, or they have been joining in enthusiastically in calling for suppression of freedom of speech for the Lebanese people on behalf of a tyrant in Dubai or a tyrant in UAE, uh, in Abu Dhabi or a tyrant in Riyadh. Well, that I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much, Assad, Thank for, you very for much, coming Rani. back and giving your take. You. And now to our original interview on Lebanon and the past and how it affects the present, which is more relevant than ever. And I guess let's just get right into it. Um, you know, Assad, as you know, the Lebanese forces led by Samir Jaja appear to be kind of like the last weapon of Western imperialism and the Saudis in Lebanon at this point. And we know they were uh, involved in turning the 2019 uprising in Lebanon into a tool to go after Hezbollah and the resistance. We know they get money from the Saudis. And we know they shot at Shia protesters recently. So since they're in the news and getting all this attention, I think it's a good point, a good time to, to kind of go back and explain to people who are these so-called Lebanese forces, what are their origins, and what was their role in the Lebanese civil war and after? Uh, yeah, I mean, these are the important questions. And I think there's a lot of confusion and misconceptions about what's happening in Lebanon. And I also have to say, I have not been happy with the campaign by Hezbollah and its supporters uh, to elevate unwittingly the status of Samir Jaja. I mean, Samir Jaja is not a significant figure. And I worry this recent attention to his person has really increased his price to those who pay him. And that is namely uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Saudi Arabia, for the last couple of years, has cut off funding to all political parties, except groups and personalities here and there, except for the Lebanese forces. They really bank on them. They think, foolishly, that they are able to use them in the future 
as a bulwark against Hezbollah. And of course, that's fanciful because the power of Hezbollah has been sufficient to humiliate the Israeli army, let alone a ragtag army of uh, not very highly trained people of the new generation of the Lebanese forces. Uh, he is really a, not a significant figure, but I think that what is happening is significant. And I also believe that the United States relies more on the Lebanese army as a bulwark against Hezbollah. And they foolishly think that this badly trained Lebanese army, which is good <laughs> enough only for spectacles and shows they do in schools, elementary schools around the country. And they have four Cessna planes that they parade, that they are the Lebanese Air Force. And uh, I mean, they basically allow them to catch sacks of potatoes uh, and uh, detergent that are passing through Lebanese Syrian borders. I mean, that's their mission. Anything that has to do with the southern Lebanese border, they are not allowed to go there. They're not allowed to have any uh, surveillance posts or anything like that, only on the eastern and the northern fronts of Lebanon. Uh, Samir Jaja is trying to show eagerness that he is a capable of standing to Hezbollah in order to increase his price. But there is evidence, at least footage-wise, uh, that the Lebanese army was involved. The first shots were fired by Lebanese soldiers, in fact, and that is something that has not been highlighted in Lebanon because everybody, and that's part of the Western-funded campaign, want to raise the status and the profile of the Lebanese army. So they are afraid of saying anything negative. And what's funny about Lebanon is that those false, fake revolutionaries uh, who want to change the system and do all of that, you notice that they don't say a word about the Lebanese army, which is a very traditional and poorly prepared uh, mm. ragtag uh, force that can barely stand up to thugs in the streets, let alone defend Lebanon. And, and we are being told by American propaganda and Gulf propaganda that this Lebanese army can be the sole protector of Lebanon, meaning that if Israel were to attack, we don't need the resistance of South Lebanon, that the Lebanese army is capable of handling them. I mean, if that's the case, the obvious question is, uh, why did they not lift a finger and they hid in their beds in 2006? Why did they never play a role? And why does the Lebanese army commander today not even dare mention Israeli threats and dangers to Lebanon? The Israeli violations of Lebanon, you're there and you know that, are regular, daily basis almost. And yet the Lebanese army does not respond to that except by saying, we have complained to the uniform forces in South Lebanon about these recent violations and we will follow up the matter with them. That's the response. That's their strategy as an alternative strategy for the defense of Lebanon. Now, the history of the Lebanese forces is a checkered one, and it is marred and littered with series of massacres and war crimes. Going back all the way to 1958, and people who complain about people like you and me, that we exaggerate Western intervention, and that we are conspiracy theorists, as you know, we wear that tag proudly, because if you don't see Western conspiracies conspiracies in our land, you really are not informed about what's happening in the last so many decades, and you are not understanding uh, what is happening uh, in the Middle East region as well. Uh, since 1958, Israel and the United States have been heavily involved in Lebanese conflict. In 1958, there was a president who refused to leave his office, and he wanted to renew his term ex uh, indefinitely. And he, he, and he took the country to civil war. And he was armed and financed by a combination of Arab reactionary governments, the usual suspects, and the West, United States chiefly, as well as Israel. Israel has been a party to our conflict uninterruptedly since 1948, but certainly in the conflict of 1958. And let us remember the Falange Party, the mother party from which came the Lebanese forces, have been proven through Israeli archives to have received funding from Israel for its election campaign as early as the 1950s. And it has been uninterrupted since then. So the civil war did not go the way they wanted. The US Marines were deployed and there was a formula reach. But basically from that time, the Lebanese army was the mission of choice for the West and the United States and Israel to stand up to not only the Palestinian resistance, which didn't even exist in the late 50s and early 60s, but to stand up to the left. Remember, Lebanon was an important base for Western conspiracies against leftism. 
and Gulf regimes in the West invested heavily in Lebanon in the reactionary for Lebanon, Salam, and the Ahrar part and others in order to fend off the rising tide, not only of the left, but of nationalism. And in fact, uh, former chief uh, of the Middle East at the CIA, Arch Roosevelt, in his book, For Lust of Knowing, admits, he said, we treated forces of Arab nationalism as a twin evil like communism of the world. And there was a lot of money and, and weapons invested in Lebanon to that effect. So by the late 60s, the Palestinian resistance was rising. And that's when the game started. The Falange Party became the vessel of choice for the United States, Israel, Western government. I mean, Rania, we have now from American archives so many documents, and there were books that were published, dissertation that were published. There was James Stoker's book, Spheres of Influence. There was a dissertation, pub uh, not published, uh, which was written in uh, Sweden. Uh, there is a new dissertation by Nate George at Rice University uh, on the Lebanese Civil War, which I cannot wait for it to go public uh, in a book form. And he tells me it is going to be soon published and so on. And we know from there the extent to which the tentacles of the American Western conspiracy were heavily involved inside Lebanon. For example, the Falange Party was receiving funds and arms from such a large constellation of forces. They were getting, a count with me, from the United States, from United Kingdom, from West Germany, from Belgium, from Spain, from Spain of Franco, from reactionary forces in Italy. They were receiving volunteers from Upper Side South Africa, Many of the snipers of the Lebanese Civil War were actually white supremacist snipers of South Africa. And in order to ingratiate themselves with them, imagine the, the sinister racism of the phalange. Uh, are you eating something in the microwave, by the way? No, uh, sorry, that's the AC. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> 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 no, please continue because this is an important, you know, right. I'm glad that you're, I just want to make one quick comment. I'm really glad that right. you're contextualizing this in a sort of like international, like imperialism versus the left in Lebanon, because so right. often the Lebanese civil war is framed as this like really chaotic, inexplicable sectarian bloodbath. So, so please continue because this is very important what you're saying. You, you're so right about that, Rania, and what is disturbing, and you, you uh, follow Lebanon very closely, is that we have now this new revitalized liberal left whose connection to the left are non-existence, mm. who are now trying to downplay the role of the Western conspiracy inside Lebanon. And let us face it, I mean, the left has been co-opted by a lot of reactionary forces and has become unrecognizable. I mean, we have left today in, from Iraq to Morocco to elsewhere, which basically claim that there is something called Iranian imperialism and Russian imperialism <laughs> and so Chinese ridiculous. imperialism, and it is tantamount to American imperialism. And to the viewers, I say, remember this. Of the officially declared U.S. military bases in the world, there are 800. Of Russian bases in the world, there is one in Tartus, and very modest one. And for China, they have one military base, and that is in Djibouti. I mean, the scale between the two. And most importantly, America has been at war with our region uninterruptedly since 1990. When, I mean, Russia was heavily involved in the war in Syria, granted for sure. And I am not a fan of that intervention, especially because Russia cooperates with Israel. Uh, but can we compare America's heavy-handed military involvement in every Arab country, except Algeria, because they have dignity and self-respect. The military of the United States is present everywhere, in every Arab country. I mean, Lebanon is a major military and intelligence base for the United States. And what is hilarious in Lebanon is that you have all these NGOs that work at the behest of the Gulf countries and the Western governments who are saying Iran is subject to Iranian occupation. Lebanon, I mean, sorry, Lebanon is subject to Iranian occupation. Iran controls Lebanon while in reality, I mean, let us be specific, who controls Lebanon? America controls the Lebanese armed forces. America controls and pays for the heads of all intelligence services. America controls all the banking sector, all the business elite of Lebanon. 90%, 90% of the corrupt political class of Lebanon are clients of the United States. And that includes allies of Hezbollah, like Nabih Birri and the Amal movement, allies of Hezbollah. 
America runs the scene. America controls the media. I mean, you see the media of Lebanon, or are paid for by UAE and or Saudi Arabia and the United States, which has been mm -hmm. investing heavily for the last two years in order to create a counter fake narrative about what's happening in Lebanon. Now, going back to the origin story, so what I was trying to tell you is the constellation of forces that were helping the Falange in those times. All conservative Arab governments uh, from the Gulf to North Africa were assisting and arming the Falange. And let us, not men let us not forget how much the Shah of Iran was investing in arming and financing the Falange, and of course, Israel. Israel was not only in direct contact, we now know from the archives, with the Falange and all right-wing militias, but also with the Lebanese army. The Lebanese army before 1975, all the way until 1989, when a patriotic man named Emil Lahoud became the commander of the army, and he is the only Lebanese army commander in the history of Lebanon who was genuinely anti-Zionist, who was genuinely pro-resistance, and who was genuinely uncorrupt. He couldn't be paid off, and to his and to his credit, and to his credit, he, he hung up the phone on Madden Albright. I mean, you have seen the Lebanese political class. You see how lowly they are. You see how yeah. subservient. You see how subservient they are to the lowest ranking member of any Western embassy. Emil Lahoud loves to tell the story, and I've heard it from him personally. How he hung up the phone on Madden Albright when she tried to extract concession on him about his firm stand against Israel. So. From 1948 until 1989, when Emil Lahoud took over, and of course the Lebanese Army Command changed since, uh, the Lebanese Army was really a militia that was mm -hmm. serving at the behest of the United States and Israel. We now know from American archives that uh, Israel coordinated its attacks and bombing. I mean, look how sinister and look how uh, treacherous the Lebanese army coordinated Israeli attacks on sites of Palestinians inside Lebanon. So mm -hmm. when the Israeli army in the 1960s and 70s, when I was growing up and we would visit my uh, grandparents' uh, house in Tyre, which you have seen, uh, yeah. I know. Yeah, it's a great house, isn't it? One of the, one of <laughs> the most ancient houses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's condemned. You cannot go up the stairs. But imagine we'd go there. Every few weeks, we visit my grandparents' house. And... On a weekly basis, there were Israeli bombing on Lebanon. And we now know from American archives, uh, declassified documents, that in fact, those attacks were coordinated with the Lebanese army of Lebanon because Western governments were investing in the Lebanese army, army in coordination with Israel to take down the Palestinian resistance and, don't forget, and the Lebanese left. They were going after both. The notion that the Falange party was only trying to save Lebanon from uh, the Palestinian resistance movement is a folly. Because we now know, and, and I mean, my project for retirement in a number of years is going to be the history of the 75-76 war, and I have been collecting all the documents for that. And I can attest to you that if you look at the daily statement of the Falange leader, Pierre Jemayin, much of his rhetoric was directed at the Lebanese left more than on the PLO. There was a real rise of the Lebanese left at the time. I mean, they did a lousy job of countering the right. That's a different story. We'll talk about that. I will mention it in a second. But what I was trying to say is, so you have the Falange that were banked, that were, that were banked on by a large constellation of international forces. And against them was pitted the Lebanese left, which was led by liberal-leaning leftists and some of them feudal sectarian forces like Kemal Jumbla or uh, the Lebanese part, the Communist Party leadership, which entirely, which entirely believed uh, in parliamentary struggle to change Lebanon. Imagine that was it's not a very struggle. communist. It's not very communist. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> all I mean, all what they wanted to have their party leader elected as a member of the parliament. And look at the yeah. shame. In 1970 presidential election, the closest presidential election in Lebanese history, Western forces and the Gulf invested. To, make, to, to allow a right-wing reactionary, Suleiman Frangi, to become the president of Lebanon. Lebanese Communist Party issued, I mean, sent a delegation to extend congratulations on this right-wing anti-leftist president. And Kemal Jumblat participated through his parliamentary bloc 
in electing this reactionary individual. So against this heavily armed, heavily financed uh, right-wing militias of the Falange and other groups, the Lebanese left was ill-prepared. I mean, mm. the PLO was ill-prepared, and Yasser Arafat did not believe in intervening in Lebanese struggle, even if what was happening in Lebanon was directed at the very heart of the Palestinian revolution. Thanks to the ill-preparedness and foolishness of Yasser Arafat and his entire subservience to Gulf government, he allowed the Lebanese scene from 75 to 82 to be run by enemies of Palestine and eventually achieved the consequences of the Israeli invasion, which resulted in the expulsion of the mm -hmm. PLO from Lebanon and for all intents and purposes, killing the Palestinian revolution. Right. The Palestinian revolution has been killed since 1982. All what we see around are... And that's you know, the year, just to, just to be clear to the listeners and viewers, 1982 is the year that Israel invaded Lebanon. The year that Israel invaded Lebanon among many invasions. In 1978, mm -hmm. Israel also invaded Lebanon, but the big mega invasion was in 82. In 1978, Israel also invaded Lebanon in March, and I lost in May of 1978 a dear friend and comrade. I want to mention his name as a tribute, Iyad Nuruddin Limdawar, his... Uh, Nom de Guerre was Ihab, and he was on his way with a comrade uh, to basically uh, deal with Israeli occupation army soldiers. And unfortunately, they were shot by French paratroopers in South Lebanon as part of the Unifil at the time. So in 1982, there was a massive invasion, which resulted in the death of 20,000 Lebanese, Palestinians, and Syrians, mostly civilians. And this estimate is conservative from an Nahar newspaper, which, as you know, is a racist, sectarian, right-wing newspaper, which, which lives <laughs> on, on, Gulf, on Gulf money and Western money. Now, mm. so uh, there was a lot of investment in the Lebanese army to take on the Palestinians. In 1973, there was a major showdown, and the Lebanese army used its uh, fighter jets. It had fighter jets at the time, Hawker Hunter. They were not as advanced as Phantom that Israel had at the time, but they were used to bomb Palestinian refugee camps. But the Palestinians and their Lebanese allies fought heroically in 1973. I was 13 years old. And they fought heroically. And they humiliated the Lebanese army. It was <laughs> then in May of 1973 that the president of Lebanon, the one who was congratulated with the, by the Lebanese uh, Communist Party and Kemal Jumblad, that man came and invited all leaders of the right-wing militias and told them, my army has not been able to take on the Palestinians. I now surrender the matter to you. I wow. open all warehouses of the Lebanese army. You feel free, help yourself to all the weapons of Lebanon to your side. And the Lebanese army was led by a, by a sectarian elite that was pretty much, I can say, not different in agenda and role from the South Lebanon army which is the Israeli surrogate militia created in South Lebanon after 1976. So by then, the Lebanese militias started receiving plenty of arms and money and uh, assistance from uh, the large constellation of forces, and the United States was banking on them to do the job. And that's how the civil war started. But the story gets even more interesting if you look at the archives around it. What do mm -hmm. I see from the archives that is of interest to the viewers and to you? We noticed several things. One of them is that even Muslim leaders betrayed the Palestinians. Even Muslim leaders who at the time were speaking in praise of the PLO and so on, down in meeting with U.S. embassy officials, mm -hmm. they betrayed the Palestinians. And they approved all the bombing and attacks on the Palestinians. They were not champions of the Palestinians in those meetings. That's one surprise. Second surprise, the extent to which U.S. heavy-handed role was present in the Lebanese conflict throughout the world. They were really a party to that conflict along with Israel. Like Lebanese uh, phalange media had Israeli handlers who controlled the message. And I have to tell you, as somebody who grew up in that war, their media were much more advanced and much more powerful in broadcast. Back then, there were no TV, there were uh, radio stations. And they were really powerful compared to what we have on the other side in West Beirut. 
I'll give you an example about heavy-handed American role. Uh, there is in Lebanon, if you're going up to the mountains, an area you know, to Ale, mm. you know, there is a very crooked uh, uh, part of the road, Kahali, the Kahali mm -hmm. section uh, in that area, which is a, a stronghold for the Falange historically. In 1969, Bashir Ismail and his henchmen were really trying to instigate the war early as early as 1969. They didn't want to start it, uh, to wait for 75. They tried hard to start the war early, but unfortunately for them, the PLO and the Lebanese left didn't want anything to do with that. They didn't believe that there was a war coming. They were so ill-prepared. They didn't mm -hmm. want to train their men. They didn't want to arm. They didn't ask for help. They just were hoping I mean, the liberal mindset that if we just let it go, we will be able to achieve to have two MPs from the left in the Lebanese parliament. That was their goal and that was their agenda. And Kamal Jumlat wanted to increase the size of his parliamentary bloc. So in 19, so in 69, the Falange militiamen used to have a checkpoint there and used to provoke Palestinians if they pass. Sometimes there would be a group of Palestinians passing, they would shoot at them. They would just kill them, massacre them. One time there was a convoy of Quran, printed Quran, uh, brought from Saudi Arabia. I mean, because these were sectarian who really had hatred for all Muslims, you know. Mm. And these are the ones who are now the recipient of Saudi and UAE money. Remember that. Those people have a bloody record, not only in messing with Palestinians, but in massacring uh, Muslims and mm -hmm. engaging in sectarian cleansing of all areas of uh, West Beirut. I mean, I had a relative who lived in Ashrafi, which is in East Beirut, and he is one of those people who were evicted. They didn't want Muslim. They want to achieve sectarian purity. I mean, this is a racist party that founded on the Nazi doctrine. I mean, mm -hmm. this, is not, this is not an allegation. The founder of the Falange party, Pierre Jumail, attended the Olympic game in Berlin in 36, came to Lebanon full of excitement, and full of admiration for Nazism, and he created a Lebanese phalange. And of course, the Lebanese phalange, the name itself, is taken from Franco's phalange in Spain. I mean, the story is, is, is mm -hmm. not even a secret, right? So, uh, so the phalange uh, had the, you know, the blood of innocent Muslims on their hand, and they were the first one who started killing purely on the basis of sectarian identity of their enemies. So they were trying to instigate a war. So in 1969, in one of those cases of provocation, there was a convoy of Palestinians. They shot at them. They killed people. We now know from the archives, and I saw this in the dissertation uh, by the brilliant Nate George from Rice University, uh, which was his PhD dissertation. Right, right. You know Nate. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Great guy. Great guy. Yeah, and great writer, by the way. Uh, his dissertation, which I recommend that you read, reads like a thriller. It's so I read it twice, and I couldn't put it down on both both times. Uh, we, we learned from that dissertation because he went through the archives meticulously. There is a document that showed there was an American general standing in Kahali with the Falange wow. thugs when they were shooting at Palestinian innocent uh, Palestinian civilians in order to start a civil war. But the PLO did not want to start a civil war. The Lebanese left didn't want to start a civil war. So it took several years for the war to finally be unleashed and with full investment by the United States and Western powers and the reactionary Arab government, as well as the Shah of Iran. Notice, Rania, when the Shah of Iran was heavily involved in Lebanese affairs, when he was arming and financing a variety of political parties, notice that nobody used to complain about Iranian hegemony in Lebanon. Yeah. The United States, <laughs> very United good States, United States at the time never raised alarm about, look what Iran is doing in Lebanon. And trust me, we now know there's a very good article about Iranian role in Lebanon before the war, during the Shah's time. I mean, they were so meticulously involved in the minute affairs of Lebanon. They were buying off politicians, they were buying off media, and so on. Uh, so the war broke, up in, uh, broke out in 1975. The United mm -hmm. States was invested in it, but the job could not be done because the phalange, uh, they never entered a military war without being humiliated and defeated. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and, and, and in 1976, when they were about to get a really good beating once and for all, they pleaded with the Syrian regime 
to send its forces, and Syria did against the Lebanese left in the PLO, and they resurrected those Falange and their allies yeah. in Lebanon. By 1978, they switched and they started to beg for Israeli intervention. And by 1977, after the Likud took over, there was a very uh, heavy new vitalized interest by Israel and Lebanon. Not that Israel under labor was not intervening heavily in Lebanese affairs, but that interest became big because they were investing in the personality of the murderer, war criminal by the name of Bashir Jamayel. So Bashir Jamayel, Rania, he was the chief of the military branch of the Falange party, which was headed by his father. It's a family affair, by the way. I mean, yeah. the, Fal the Falange party today is headed by a nephew of Bashir Jamayel, who is a grandson of the founder of the Falange party. And this uh, little guy, Sami Jamayel, has <laughs> last, week, <laughs> last week was on a visit to US Congress and the State yeah. Department and he was treated like a big dignitary because he has uh, he has a, a block with, with a whopping number of three members. One of them is leading, in fact. <laughs> and he was treated like a national leader because the Americans believe he can be used effectively against uh, people who believe in the resistance of Lebanon against, against Israel. So uh, the Falange remains. Now, the Lebanese forces was taken over by Bashir Jamayel. Of course, he had many allies, but he didn't like to have any rivals. So he massacred his rivals. He massacred his rivals in 1980, the Ahrar, the Tigers. He massacred the Frangia clan in 1978 and killed the family, the, the family dog, and even the children and so on. And he engaged in many massacres in order to become the sole leader of the right-wing militias. And he did all that with full endorsement and support by the Israelis uh, of Lebanon, uh, in Lebanon. And by 1982, as we know, the Israeli invasion, one of its objectives was to secure the installation of Bashir Jamayel as the, like, like uh, you know, the Nazis in France and the Pétain government uh, there. They installed their own puppet as president of Lebanon. And, but of course, their joy did not last long because as, you know, a few days after mm -hmm. he was installed as president, uh, a man by the name of Habib Shartouni uh, yeah. managed to uh, kill that man. Mm hmm. Um, I mean, it's it's really it's really incredible what you just mentioned, by the way, about Sam Ismail going to Congress. He met with Adam Schiff, who's like the neocon Democrat uh, who likes to interfere in every country where there's any resistance to U.S. hegemony or the hegemony of its allies. Um, but, you know. Then throughout the 80s, you actually do have the rise of a different kind of resistance, right? You talk about the left kind of utterly failing, which it sadly did, um, against these, these this really international attempt to destroy uh, leftism and Palestinian resistance in Lebanon. And that's when you have the rise of the of Hezbollah throughout the 80s. Uh, throughout the 90s, they help push Israel out of Lebanese lands. They continue to do so in 2006 when Israel invaded again. And now we're where we are today, where a lot of the the lines between resistance versus, I guess, anti-resistance versus pro-imperialism lie in the same places in the sense of all of these right-wing factions you're talking about, which is why it's so important that you're giving this history of the phalange, specifically of Lebanese forces, because these continue to be the tools in Lebanon. And you might be right, it's not a great idea to give them too much uh, attention, because at the end of the day, they actually Today. don't have that much power in Lebanon. Exactly. Um, exactly. All of exactly. all of their power comes from outside and exactly. and how they're portrayed. But within exactly. the country, I mean, they have no power. They just don't. Exactly. They have the ability to cause some problems here and there. Exactly. Um, exactly. Exactly right. Exactly right. But, I think we should. Yes. Go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, you know, bringing it kind of back to the present day. Um, I'm curious, do you think this current, and I know this sounds like switching gears, but I, I, I think it's related. Do you think that the current economic crisis that's occurring in Lebanon right now has something to do with the fact that perhaps Lebanon, because of the weakness of the people that you just described at this current moment, perhaps that means Lebanon has lost its value to global capitalism, to global imperialism, and nobody Not, wants to bail it out. Like the proxies of the Saudis and the Americans have been utter failures as a weapon against the resistance. 
So it's kind right. of like, to me, it seems like it could be almost like a divestment from Lebanon by these forces. Not, not at all. Not at all. I think that it's fair to say Saudi Arabia has given up on trying to create a Lebanese domestic force against Hezbollah because they now totally abandon, uh, you know, Hariri, uh, uh, Saad al-Hariri and so on. They're trying new forces. Uh, and uh, they like Samir Jaja, both UAE uh, as well as Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, Mohammed bin Zayed, really like uh, Samir Jaja. I mean, I think they like his fascism, they like his racism, and they also like his resume. I mean, he has a series of uh, massacres and war crimes on his resume, and that impresses the hell out of them because they have been trying to emulate the resume of massacres and war crimes in Yemen, among other places. Uh, so Samir Jaja's role, you're right, you're right, unlimited. However, the United States is far from giving up on Lebanon. Rania, the United Lebanon is a major military intelligence base for the United States. The United States is now working on inaugurating one of the biggest embassies for the US in the world. It is gonna be a major intelligence center. It also is a center for monitoring all resistance groups around the region, and they are dominating the Lebanese army. They have a militia in Lebanon. Under this current commander-in-chief, the Lebanese army is now a pro-US militia. And there are people in the Lebanese army, officers, who write to me about the pain they feel about what's happening. There was a Lebanese army officer who, will not, who I will not name. He told me because of the economic crisis, uh, we have now been reduced in our meal rations, where meat has become scarce. He mm -hmm. said, imagine my sorrow when the Lebanese army commander hosted the US ambassador, Dorothy Shia, and he said, we were asked to serve her sushi. He said, imagine oh. some of us are going to bed hungry and we were asked to serve sushi to the visiting US ambassador of Lebanon in a military base. The U.S. military presence in Lebanon is extensive, from the north in Hamad and Riyadh and other military bases, all the way, all under the pretext, training the Lebanese army. I am dying for somebody to tell me, you have been training that Lebanese army for years. What do you have to show me for that training? The fact that they stop people smuggling potato sacks along the Syrian border, or they are yeah. smuggling detergent. I mean, what can you show me from that? When there was a threat to Lebanon of ISIS as well as Al-Qaeda, Nusra along the border, it wasn't the Lebanese army who took them on. It was volunteers, largely Hezbollah, who took them on. And they were the one who defeated them. And they were the one who kicked them out of, Le of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. The Lebanese army had, at the end of the show, that was funny, by the way, at the end of it, the US embassy was so freaked out that since Hezbollah defeated them, it looks like it's gonna take so much credit so they arranged for the Lebanese army in the last remaining days of the defeat of these forces. They told them, go and shell these positions in the hills. I mean, there was nobody there. And they, put, they took all the TV cameras and they made a big show about, and they gave it a military code name for that Battle of Jerud, the Battle of the Rugged Hills, you know, as if the Lebanese army was the one who kicked it. Oh, uh, and, and in reality, when both of these groups, Nusra as well as ISIS, uh, kidnapped Lebanese army soldiers and officers and killed them, the Lebanese army didn't lift a finger. They did not even defend themselves, even though they were highly trained by the US. But most importantly, have you ever heard of a Middle East Arab army trained by the US or Middle East non-Arab army trained by the US which did not, which did not collapse in the first moment when its services were needed? I mean, they trained you know and invested <laughs> you know billions. What, you know what? <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to make one point. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, well, just, you know, what's also funny about this. I mean, the reason the U.S. invests so much in the Lebanese army is because they, well, of course, they don't want a well-trained army that could ever fight Israel. They think it's exactly. some sort of like bulwark against Hezbollah. Exactly. But exactly. the funny thing about that is that. I mean, a significant portion of the people in the Lebanese army actually support Hezbollah. And if it ever came down to it, I know many people in the Lebanese army, some of whom actually joined the army after 2006 out of a passion to defend Lebanon because they were so inspired by seeing Hezbollah push the Israelis out. They would never 
fight Hezbollah. And so it's just a pipe dream for the U.S. that they think that this army would actually cohesively, uh, first of all, A, be able to fight Hezbollah because they can't, but also B, there would be many of them who would just walk off the job and join the other side. Exactly. It's just complete insanity and delusion. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Rania, um, uh, what you said is so true. They will never take that job. I mean, what they do is the Lebanese army commander comes to Washington. He's coming to Washington in a few days. And they promise the Americans, we're going to take on Hezbollah. They make promises. They receive money. And they receive aid. What kind of aid they receive? They, they receive helicopters to transport the high officers of the army. They get nice cars. They get nice gadgets. They get uh, masks. They get boots. I mean, that's what they get. I mean, something that is insignificant to the military balance between us and Israel. Mm -hmm. And you're right. If the army were to take a role against Hezbollah, it will split like it did in 1975. Yeah. There's no way. It, there's no way. And, and, and most importantly, back in 1975, the Lebanese army was supposed to take on PLO and Lebanese left. Let me tell you this. What Hezbollah militarily is today is more than hundredfold what the yeah. PLO and the Lebanese left were. I will tell you an anecdote. In 2009, you know, in May 7th, for a couple of days, when Hezbollah and its allies went to take on their rival, and there was a militia in Lebanon by the Hariris funded by the Saudis. And they took them on and they took on Jumblat's militia and so on. Uh, May 7th, right? Yeah, One May 7th, 2008, 2008. 2008, I'm sorry, you're right, yeah. you're right. 2008. Uh, one of the SSNP fighters who participated, he tells me the story. He was with them in Hamra. He told me the Lebanese army were so scared of these highly trained Hezbollah fighters. He said, whenever a convoy of the Lebanese army passed, they would raise their hand like this and scream, please don't shoot us. We are Lebanese army. We are Lebanese army. And one time a soldier was passing and he saw them and he screamed, I am from South Lebanon. I'm from South Lebanon. I mean, that's it. But, 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 but we have record. Look at the highly trained Afghan army, which the U.S. Yeah. invested in billions of them. Look how they collapsed after what, a day since the WS group? Look at the Iraqi army, which collapsed under ISIS, you know? Mm -hmm. That's the fate of army. That's the fate. U.S. trains the Arab armies for two reasons. One, to make sure they stay weak and ineffective vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Two, in order to control them and recruit among them and to run them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very well said. I wanted to ask you about, um, well, I have many questions left for you, but I guess right, I, I, for this moment, I want to turn to the issue of a group that actually was absent from the recent um, shooting, uh, which was the Sunni party. The Sunni, and, and this, this goes to the issue of Sunni Shia tension seemed to be at an all-time low, really, since 2005. So I'm curious... To what do you attribute this? And then also uh, to build off that, you know, what was the legacy of Rafi al-Hariri and why is it wrong to romanticize him? Because he's often romanticized in Western media. You know, Rania, in the history of Lebanon since 1948, Lebanon has always been split. There was always a constellation, a coalition of forces, political forces that were really underhandedly, surreptitiously aligned with Israel. And there was opposition groups that were opposed to Israel. Since 1948, it hasn't changed. The name of these coalitions changes. Uh, the personalities change. But the agenda does not change. There was mm -hmm. always a camp that is run by the West and the Gulf and that is aligned with Israel. And there was always a group against. Now, of course, as it happens, unfortunately, even with the opposition camp, there's infiltration where we now know that Israel and the Americans have their own people in the other rival camp. Like yeah. in 1973, it was discovered the PFLP, there was a central committee member who used to write the minutes of meeting and he would uh, and he would report to the Lebanese Dozian Bureau, the intelligence service of the Lebanese army. Wow. And he, he was caught and he confessed and he was arrested and he was there was an order for his execution. But in under circumstances that are uh, too complicated to tell the audience, he was able to flee. And he went to the UAE in 1982, and he became a journalist in their media. The wife, the, the widow of George Habash, the widow of George Habash to this very day, she's alive, Hilda Habash. 
To this very day, she believes that he was not only working for the Lebanese army intelligence, but that he was working for Israel as well. So it was a lot of infiltration. The PLO was extremely yeah. broad. And this is what frustrates Israel and America about Hezbollah. They are much more difficult to infiltrate, much more difficult to recruit among them. Of course, there were cases. Of course, there were cases. Uh, but nothing like what we have back then. Yeah. Rania, if you, ask me, if you ask me about the Lebanese national movement, I would say overwhelmingly the majority of the leaders of that movement today belong to the reactionary, anti-Palestinian, anti-resistance camp. And many of them were put on the payroll of Rafiq Hariri's family by 1980s, by 1980s. Now, to Rafiq Hariri. So Rafiq Hariri had a very sinister agenda. He was suddenly thrusted on Lebanon by Saudi Arabia and was endorsed by the Syrian regime. The Syrian regime is a very corrupt regime, and Rafiq Hariri was able to enter the Syrian regime through the corruption by bribing people, buying them off. People like Hikmat Shihabi, Lebanese, I'm sorry, Syrian Army Intelligence, Abdul Halim Khaddam, the chief uh, foreign policy maker in Syria. He was mm -hmm. foreign minister, then became vice president of Syria. Uh, he also hired the chief of Syrian intelligence inside Lebanon, Ghazi Kanaan. Uh, and he controlled, I mean, uh, Joshua Landis, who writes on Syria, for example, has a theory that the reason that he was uh, assassinated is that Rafiq Hariri was, with the help of Saudi Arabia, was trying to stage a coup inside Syria to replace Bashar al-Assad by his own men. I mean, I don't know the truth to that theory, but to tell you how the tentacles of Rafiq Hariri and his massive system of corruption uh, not only polluted Lebanon, but also polluted Syria. So Rafiq Hariri, uh, his agenda was very clear. He came to Lebanon. In the 1980s, he was part of the people who supported May 17 agreement, which is the peace treaty between Lebanon and Israel under Amin Jumayr. That's when he became part of the scene, and he was at the time introduced as a Saudi envoy, not as a Lebanese. <laughs> That's he, amazing. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and, and if you look at the footage of early Rafiq Hariri, you would see Bandar bin Sultan, who was very active in Lebanon, and behind him, there was Rafiq Hariri with the Arab headdress and so on, behind him and he was Saudi and Saudi envoy uh, but then he brandished his Lebanese citizenship and he, he the Syrian regime we I blame the Syrian regime for picking this man and making him prime minister of Lebanon and that's where his conspiracies and machination began and he invested heavily in the peace between Lebanon and Israel and he used mm -hmm. to say that when peace comes there is going to be prosperity in Lebanon of course he he at the time, put in place this corrupt central bank governor of Lebanon, Riyad uh -huh. Salami, who remains today in his place by virtue of support, not only from U.S., but the Maronite Patriarch, and also by corrupt people in both camps in March 8 and March 14. From Nabih Birri to Samir Jaja yeah. to Hariri, all of them support this guy because he has dirt on all of them. He helped exactly. all of them in their corruption. So Rafiq Hariri, I would say, is the single most important person responsible for the collapse of Lebanon. This entire financial scheme was designed and engineered by a man he handpicked, Riyad Salemi, used to manage the Hariri Fund at Merrill Lynch, and he was mm -hmm. based in London. Hariri brought him to Lebanon, made him central gang governor, and he helped him to loot the Lebanese treasury because Hariri's fortune increased fourfold after he became prime minister, and he basically uh, increased and accumulated an astronomical debt uh, for the Lebanese generation that you will have many generations keep paying off a debt that was started by Rafiq Hariri. This is not to say Rafiq Hariri is the only person responsible. No, no, far from it. He had allies. He had allies like Nabih Birri. He had allies like Jumblat. He had allies like the Syrian regime, corrupt element in the regime. He had allies within Saudi Arabia and so on. So they were, it's, and of course he had sponsors in the, the West. US, yeah. US and France, they France. were the ones. I mean, the collapse of Lebanon is, whenever Lebanon was about to collapse, Hariri would arrange for a conference, Paris, mm -hmm. Paris 1, Paris 2, and so on. And they would come and bail Lebanon out and let it go on for a few years. What this time happened, the United States and its allies wanted Lebanon to fall. I mean, exactly. they did not engineer the fall, but they did. They, there is a siege on Lebanon. The U.S. and Gulf governments have a decision. Nobody is permitted to help Lebanon. They want to bring Lebanon to its knees. And in the meanwhile, 
they are now investing in new political forces. They no more want to, fu to fund uh, like the Falange or the PSP Harry. or Harim. They, Harry. they now, they are now using NGOs and people who mm -hmm. call themselves, you, you've seen those clowns in Hamra, you, these who call themselves <laughs> Revolutionaries, right? So, the ones yeah. who well, that's, right. that's actually, this is a perfect segue to the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, when we look at what happened in October with the protests in October 2019, in your opinion, was it a revolution? Was it a conspiracy of Western embassies? Was it a sincere uprising that went astray? And I think this is a perfect opportunity for you to go ahead and talk about that sort of civil society NGO sector that has, I think, become the primary tool or vehicle for Western imperialism. You're absolutely right. There is so much now. I mean, I, I learned yesterday from a source, the extent to which the US embassy is involved in cracking heads and forcing the merger of the various NGOs and groups and the civic groups and so on that call themselves revolutionary because they want them to win big in the Lebanese election uh, co coming in a few months, uh, in, in, in uh, spring of next year. Uh, I mean, those people that you've seen in Hamra banging pots and pans or chanting and so on, they are to revolution what I am to dentistry. I mean, they have no connection to revolution. <laughs> they have no connection. I mean, they have no revolution ideas. And most importantly, those are all aligned and many of them funded by West and or Gulf government. These are people who write on social media in support of Saudi Arabia and UAE. I mean, can somebody explain to me, how can you call yourself a revolutionary, but you are a fan of Saudi Arabia and UAE? Incredible. Somebody explains to me how you can be a propagandist for these two despots in those two countries, despots that are aligned with Israel today, and yet from Dubai or Riyadh or Beirut, you chant about the need for revolution in Lebanon. <laughs> what kind of revolution do they want? They don't want a revolution. They want to set up a puppet government for Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and they want to call it a revolution. That's what UAE and Saudi Arabia has been doing in our part of the world for the last 10 years. And that's what they try to do in Syria. That's what they try to do in Libya. That's what they try to do in Yemen. They want to create puppet governments all throughout. And that's their main agenda. And they want to make all these governments align with Israel. They did that to Sudan. Let us not forget. The Sudanese military junta is allied with Saudi Arabia and UAE, and they aligned with Israel, normalized with Israel, in response to demands by those two regimes. Yeah. And, you know, I the reason I even bring this up is because I've been living in Lebanon like the last five years now. And in that time, I've seen the influence that the Western-funded NGOs like have on the discourse here. Totally. And and how, well, it doesn't really change the situation on the ground at all. It does impact the way certain segments, a certain class of people think, particularly like liberal and progressive minded sort of middle and upper middle class type people. And I'm not talking about the people who are online defending Saudi Arabia. I'm talking about people who would actually consider themselves progressives. And so the danger that I see in this Western funded discourse is that it's convinced a lot of this segment of people that Lebanon's problems are all about internal deficiencies, like, you know, corruption and sectarianism, which of course are very big problems in Lebanon. However, yeah. this is not unique to Lebanon. Like other countries have these problems too, and their economies aren't collapsing and they have clean water. And like at the end of the day, this hyper focus on corruption and everything's because you know, Lebanon is like genetically deficient or something, it really does give cover to the sort of external imperialist forces that have always decided Lebanon's fate. And so I guess what's been frustrating for me is seeing people that I'm surprised to see kind of like take on that discourse and 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 take on that attitude. And ultimately, it, you know, what that ends up doing is they end up becoming, you know, activists on the side of March 14 parties, even if they don't realize it. And so I'm curious, you know, do you think that even matters? Does this segment of people even really matter at the end of the day uh, to the situation on the ground in terms of the power balance? And did these people ever really support resistance to begin with if, if maybe no. they did in rhetoric at some point, but now they've changed their minds? I mean, this is like, there are people on the left in Lebanon 
like within the yeah. Lebanese Communist Party, who tell you they support resistance, but the resistance by the Lebanese Communist Party in the 1980s, which doesn't exist. So I always tell them, so wait. <laughs> so, so, so there, oh God, we're going to get in so much trouble for this, but please right, go. Right, right. <laughs> so, so, so there is an actual resistance movement in Lebanon, which humiliated and defeated the Israeli army in 2006 in a way that the Lebanese, uh, the Israeli army was never defeated in the history of the conflict by any Arab army. And yet you tell me, you support a resistance that died back in the 1980s, so you don't support resistance. There is an actual resistance and there's an imaginary resistance. So you support an imaginary resistance. And what is sinister, Rania, is that you have reactionary media of the Gulf who are now creating a mythology about the left-wing resistance of Jamul of the 1980s. I mean, look, I am the product of that period. I am the product of those movements. And I can tell you, they were extremely limited, extremely mm. disorganized, extremely lacking in coordination. I mean, I lost a comrade because of these things. And we were nothing like what came afterward. This is like comparing, uh, you know, the Lebanese army to the Red Army, which liberated Red Ber uh, East Berlin. Mm. There's no comparison. There is no comparison. And the thing is, the major operation of the 1980s, which basically was responsible for the humiliating withdrawal uh, in two stages of the Israeli army from Lebanon, were perpetrated by these shadowy groups, so to speak, that were not part of the left wing. Uh, don't get me wrong. I doff my hat. I bow down in gratitude and in respect and admiration for all the left communists, as well as SSMP fighters who engage in heroic operation against Israel. But don't tell me that they were in any way comparable in scale of what happened later by what is called the Islamic. There's no comparison. I mean, I'll give you an example, Rania. In the time when the PLO was, was ascendant, I always give this example. Sometimes we would find a document in Hebrew and, uh, or sometimes we would listen to Israeli broadcasts that were not in Arabic or in English and we wanted a translation. We, we didn't have one Hebrew speaker. I studied Hebrew, by the way, later in the United States, but back then I... Uh, so we, we didn't have one Hebrew speaker in the entire movement. I remember they would send a car to the Institute of Palestine Studies in Verdun, and they would bring one person who was in, translated into Hebrew, and they would bring him to a, a PLO office in order to help in translation. Let me compare you to what we have now. Mm. Do you know that Hezbollah runs a Hebrew teaching school. They smart. teach they teach Hebrew to their fighters. They monitor broadcast in Hebrew. They they intercept even military uh, communications between different units, uh, mm -hmm. and they can understand it. It's a, it's a different game. And one of the things that bothers me the most, Rania, is when people tell me, oh. Uh, the resistance today is strong and powerful because Iran supports them and gives them money. And I, and I tell them, that, that frustrates me because I was around during those times. In my days, let me count the ways in which countries from around the world were helping our movement. We were receiving money and or weapons for the Lebanese national movement and the PLO from Cuba, mm -hmm. uh, East Germany, USSR, an empire, uh, all East European countries, I remember Bulgaria, for example, supporting these shadowy communist revolutionary uh, organizations in Lebanon. We were getting support from Algeria, from the Iraqi government, uh, from Libya, from, <laughs> South, from, South, from South Yemen, uh, from Syrian government, sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, don't tell me that we did not get support back then, but we did not know how to husband these resources. We squandered them. Do you want me to tell you stories about leaders of communist organizations who would receive a monthly payment from Libya to the tune of $100,000 and they were putting oh. them in their in their bank accounts? I mean, there are so many stories I know like that. So then, there was so, so then, much corruption. So then, so then the Assad, that's, I mean, that, that's... That's a good point to to reflect on, right? Which I'm glad you're saying this because you are you are a very committed supporter of resistance to occupation, as you've made very clear of occupation and resistance to imperialism. But you're a leftist, a secular leftist. 
So why but, is it? Why why did the left? Why was it such a failure? Why is there really no real left here anymore? in this region, and I know some people will take issue with me saying that because there's this or that party that calls themselves communist, but I'm here and I see it and it's, I'm sorry, but there's there's no force that's genuinely powerful and leftist here. Why isn't there? And then why are the only effective resistance groups today, when you look across the region, why are they Islamists? And I'm talking about Hamas and Gaza and Hezbollah and Lebanon, and then of course Iran, which you know, think of it what you will, but it puts up a resistance to U.S. imperialism and challenges it quite effectively for the little that it has. Why is that? Ran Rania, you have no idea how many brave military officers and revolutionaries we had in South Lebanon. There were many who were dying to fight Israel. Unfortunately, the leadership was different place. Number one reason, Yasser Arafat, he ran many of these organizations. He ran and corrupted many he ran the Communist Party. He ran uh, the SSMP under Inam Rad. He ran the Communist Action Organization. And yes, Arafat was never interested in having a resistance movement in South Lebanon. He was totally ill-prepared. And he vetoed all the pleas by people to let us prepare a response. Israeli invasion is imminent. We should be prepared. He vetoed all that. It's like Benio Brzezinski said about Arafat. He was never serious about diplomacy. And he was never serious about revolution. So that's one. Two. Communist left was too dependent on the USSR. They were mm. too happy receiving aid from them. They never managed a foreign policy or an ideology that has a bit of a distance. So by the time the USSR collapsed, they all died down immediately, in natural mm. deaths. Three, massive corruption. The money that was coming to the movement was siphoned by a lot of these leaders. Even, even groups that I was close to, revolutionary Lebanese and Palestinian, to the very far left, some of them were corrupted as well. Uh, money was siphoned, embezzlement took place. There was so much money, and unfortunately, that happened. Fourthly, none of these groups developed an indigenous ideology that would absorb the lessons of Marxism and Leninism, but would adapt it to our local environment. They did not do yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, fifth, fifthly, by virtue of Yas Arafat's ties to the Gulf and subservient Saudi Arabia, he was able to control the agendas and many of these groups. What's happening in Palestine today, Yasser Arafat still funds the PFLP. And as a result, the PFLP does not come out strongly against Mahmoud Abbas because mm -hmm. they are happy receiving these uh, monthly installments that he disperses among the various PLO components. And as a result, they still call him the, his excellency. Every time I see that, I cringe. They call him, these are leftists. They call Mahmoud Abbas His Excellency President Mahmoud Abbas, and he has not been elected for more than 10 years. So for these reasons, for those reasons, and also uh, by virtue of the changing in ideologies, the Iranian Revolution in 1979, as well as the Saudi propagation of an Islamist, radical, militant, fanatic ideology of Islam, we did not know how to handle it. Mm. Uh, and of course, the Amal movement also rose in the late 70s. We didn't know how to handle it. We were taken aback. We did not develop a response. We did not deal with that kind of fundamental threat in a way that was credible for the masses. But most importantly, yeah. Iranian, we did not run the areas of South Lebanon under our control well. There was a lot of misconduct. There were a lot of crimes. I mean, not by the communists. I can say with a clear conscience, I was around. Communist organizations, even one I was not uh, in admiration of, like Lebanese Communist Party, to their credit, they never engaged in thuggery. They never engaged in sexual harassment. They never engaged in rape. They never engaged in okay. uh, looting, <laughs> anything like that. But, but the Fatah organization, the PL organization, and some members of the Lebanese National Movement, they did a lot of this conduct that were easily capitalized on by the enemies, Israel and its allies in Lebanon, to mobilize people against the left and against the Palestinians. And for that, I have been writing, warning to Hezbollah to learn those lessons because mm -hmm. Hezbollah is aligned with some of the most corrupted forces. Corruption is the window from which the enemy infiltrates. I've seen it in the PLO. I've seen it in the Lebanese Art Movement. If you are not careful, your sectarian alliance with corrupt personalities and movement is going to be fatal.
or lethal, no, or at and, least and damaging. Has, I mean, Hezbollah, you know, you talk to people in Hezbollah. I won't say I do because I don't want to end up on some sanctions list. But you hear from you hear their concerns. I mean, they are concerned about that internally. They're very unhappy with the situation with ML. And they will argue that they feel like they're in between a rock and a hard place because when they, you know, they say their three main issues that they care the most about, like their three red lines in Lebanon are one, preventing a civil war, right? Uh, two, their weapons, protecting their weapons so they can continue to resist Israel. And then three, preventing an inter-Shia civil war because they kill, I mean, there was brother, right? That's their biggest, I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that that's what they say. Um, and that's, I mean, that is a, an important conversation to be had because people get super sensitive about that. But I do want to ask you something because this is somewhat tangentially related to this issue of like Hezbollah's alliances with corrupt parties is the issue of the Beirut port blast investigation. And while, of course, you and I are no fans of MO uh, and the people that perhaps uh, this judge who's been appointed to oversee the investigation, Zadok Bitar, want to interrogate an MO, you know, they're likely are corrupt officials, whether or not they're on U.S. sanctions lists. That said, this investigation, if you look at the list of people that have been called so far, it's people only from one side of a political coalition. They may not be Hezbollah, but it's ML figures. It's a couple people from Marada, which is the Christian party that is in the allied with Hezbollah. And like Hassan Diab, who was like, it's really unfair to blame this on that guy. He was prime minister for like eight months and he was just a sitting duck prime minister who had no time to even deal with that investigation. And there's like right. one guy, Mashnook from like you who former future guy who the future movement doesn't even like. So he's like an easy fall guy. But it's so clearly, in my opinion, at least politically motivated. So I'm curious, from your perspective, how do you see this investigation playing out? Do you think that it is be it is politically targeted? And do you think we'll ever find out what caused the blast? Um, and, you know, if it was even really the fault of individuals or perhaps just a really messed up system where kind of everybody's responsible? Let me tell you this. I have no doubt that the U.S. government knows who is behind it, and I'm certain it had nothing to do with Hezbollah. They had no oh, presence I, in the port. There is right. no question legally that the party responsible for the security of the port is the Lebanese Army Command as well as Lebanese Army Intelligence. And mm -hmm. those are clients, puppets of the United States government. And for that reason, they are spared. And that raises doubt about the intentions of this Judge Vitar. If I mean, I don't know much about this guy. And, yeah, I, and I am also, I'm not also happy with the performance of Hezbollah about that judge because Hezbollah is acting, raising such a hue and cry about this judge without telling me, why are you raising this ruckus about this judge and you are not raising a ruckus about people worse than him, like Mikati you had picked to be prime minister, or Riyad Salami, who is the head of this government, central bank, and you have not called once for his ouster. Why is it Bitar? If you think he's part of a conspiracy, tell me. Give me evidence. Also, on the subject of corruption, I mean, we ca I cannot let Hezbollah off the hook on this subject. No. I mean, I know they have concern that Amal and the intra-Shiite sectarian civil war and all that, but this has really severely damaged their image in Lebanon and beyond. They have chosen to protect their corrupt allies to be seen rightly as the chief defenders of this corrupt regime from which they were the least beneficiaries. I mean, this is ultimate political incompetence, in my opinion. Why would you take it upon yourself to defend this very corrupt regime when you were the least beneficiary of that regime? Also, also, by allying yourself with such corrupt figures, you really are opening the doors of the party of Hezbollah itself to corruptions to seep in. And mm -hmm. there are stories to that effect in South Lebanon about that. There are people who seem to not be living the modest life that was associated with the party in years past. So that's what corruption is so dangerous to play that game, to align yourself with corrupt people. And the people of South Lebanon are fed up with this corrupt system. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. And this, look what happened in Iraq. Look at the election of Iraq. I don't know if it's rigged or not, but there was clearly a message that supporters of Iran Hezbollah over there had a terrible showing. I know there is a huge propaganda bonanza campaign against you. I know that. And you know that. And because you know that, you should be more careful in your behavior. And they are not. And they are extremely clumsy and incompetent. And also, Rania, if they are rightly fearful of a civil war in Lebanon, 
why would you stage this demonstration about this judge? Why not? Which would which could take uh, you know civil unrest form as it did, and of course they have the right to protest. I'm not denying that. But why Hezbollah is in the forefront? None of the people summoned for interrogation are Hezbollah. You counted them. You named them one by one. They don't include Hezbollah. And yet Hezbollah is in the forefront. Why not Amal? Why not Merida? Let your allies be seen as the defenders of this corrupt system. But Hezbollah has none of that. To be honest with you, I have studied and written about this party for all these decades since it erased. I mean, I wrote in 85 one of the first articles about them to a journal uh, in the United States, uh, Middle Eastern Studies. And I would tell you that I cannot understand their behavior in the last two years. Since the uprising, they have been acting extremely clumsily politically, and they have been giving ammunition to their enemies. I mean, all this talk about Samir Jaja, for example, has really increased his price. I guarantee you, uh, the monthly installment to Samir Jaja from UAE and Saudi Arabia have been substantially increased by virtue of this demonization of a very insignificant character. As I mean, my, my late brother, Midhat, used to always, he hated Jaja, uh, like we all do. And he would tell me, why don't you write about Samir Jaja? And I tell him, he is not Bashir Jamail. He is so insignificant. He's so small. This guy takes order from a small, a low ranking member of the Saudi and UAE embassy. <laughs> don't get me true. wrong. Don't get me wrong. Bashir Jamail was taking orders also from low ranking intelligence officials in Israel. I know that. But at least Bashir Jamail had skills politically in reaching out, in, in appealing. Uh, dangerously to many Lebanese. This guy is like lack charisma. He lacks charisma. He lacks appeal. Uh, and and there is, I mean, the danger is by his patrons. I worry about his patrons. I wish they focus more on UAE and Saudi Arabia than on this insignificant character named Samir Jaja. So on the question of Bitar, I agree with you. We will never know why, because the U.S. will never allow it to be known. Do you know the FBI investigated the the, the blast? And yet they never told us, I'll ask you, you know enough about American foreign policy. If the FBI team came to the scene, investigated thoroughly, and if they had evidence, don't you think they would have released it to the world about Hezbollah? What of they course, will do yeah. instead, what they will do instead, they will let it hang over their shoulder, over their head, and they will keep exploiting it year after year, year after year, just like the Hariri court, which has been in honor forever. That's what they do. And most importantly, notice, Nobody has mentioned what the New York Times reported in 2019. There was an American army contractor at the port going around and he found these nitrate stored and he went to his country and told them, how come we never knew? How come this judge never asked to interview that person? He never did. Well so, you know, and it's a good point. And there's also theories that have some potential truth to them about the fact that, you know, it's not just like you mentioned, the Lebanese intel uh, army intelligence and army that oversee port stuff. There's been, um, you know, the future movement has officials who were in charge of overseeing the port as, port as well. So there's been some theories that, you know, we know the future movement was used to smuggle weapons to Syria for the supposed, you know, moderate rebels. Uh, who also happened to, you know, include people that use ammonium nitrate. So that also could have, it's, it's possible that was there to be smuggled at some point to moderate rebels in Syria. We just don't know. And like we, we and like many investigations that are politicized, we probably will never know. And I mean, I think you make some good points about uh, perhaps Hezbollah's like paranoia about this investigation. But at the same time, I do see like, I do see why they're paranoid because it's attacking their allies who they need for a coalition and government. That said, you know, I do want to zoom out for a moment from Lebanon. And I just want to know if you accept this idea that we hear a lot now, which is that the U.S. is withdrawing from the Middle East. You know, and it certainly does seem to be, at the very least, changing its posture in the Middle East. Why do you think that is? And does it create opportunities for people in the region to chart their own fate? No. The United States has not withdrawn from the Middle East. The United States will never withdraw from the Middle East. The United States is heavily involved. We're talking about the little country of Lebanon right now. The United well, States yeah. runs, the United States does, does not have an army in Lebanon. They have a lot of military presence and intelligence, but yet they run the banking sector. 
the business sector, the judiciary of Lebanon. They run the intelligence service of Lebanon. They run the Lebanese army, and they run 90% of the political class. They run all NGOs, and they run the bulk of the media, with the exception of a handful of media organizations that are not loyal to the United States. So the United States runs the show in most Arab countries. What is changing is mm. the nature of this intervention. Uh, they are making it less contracted. They are subcontracting. There is a major uh, alliance in the Middle East today, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel. And they are now aligned with the United States, and they are being asked to undertake mission on behalf of U.S. imperialism. And not only that, they are even allowing them to uh, do their own initiative if they want, and the U.S. will put up with it. Look at the Biden administration. The Biden administration, to the disregard of mainstream media, has basically indulged the Gulf despots as much, if not more, than Trump administration. I can tell you right now, the officials that have been visiting and praising the Saudi government over the last few months, to my knowledge, has been more frequent and more vociferous, if you read the Saudi media, than they were under Trump. Because mm -hmm. Trump's made the relationship very personal and contractual. Him and MBS, Jared Kushner and MBS. Uh, now under Biden, it is institutionalized. It covers all layers of government. Do you know that John Kerry, I could be mistaken, but I believe he visited Saudi Arabia more than he visited any other country since he was appointed as <laughs> this, this, this bogus uh, environment envoy of the United States. Interesting the place to visit. The world's the like biggest oil producer at exactly, the Qatar. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And of course, he flew there on his private jet, but that's a different story. Uh, so the Biden administration is extremely invested in those regimes, and it is far from being withdrawing. Uh, but I think what the United States is doing is to deceive us. Mm -hmm. They want us to believe. Uh, but, 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 but also, I mean, there is a change in that the United States invested heavily in there by money and blood in different parts, and they failed. They were mm -hmm. defeated. They were defeated in Iraq. They were defeated in Afghanistan. They did not do well in Syria. They were defeated. So, I mean, they are a lesson of defeat, but don't get me wrong. This is a war empire. And they always want to protect their machismo and their image around the world as an empire. And as a result, in a year or two, we will see them going to the region to kick some ass and try to direct their sagging image fortunes. I hope not, but we'll have to wait and see. I, I, you know, and just for a more regional question, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon are all suffering from similar economic crises. And, and Jordan. Disastrous, and, and, well, yeah, that's true. And Jordan increasingly, and disastrous political systems. Do you think there can be greater cooperation or unity between these countries to help address their common needs? And then, of course, will there be, which are two very different questions, but. You're absolutely right. And we find now, that uh, Jordanians, Syrians, and Lebanese, for the first time in a long time, are cooperating on as people, what is to the benefit of the people. And by the way, Jordan, just like Syria and Lebanon, has been subject to a siege by Gulf government. I mm. mean, Jordan is going through economic crisis, and they have been putting so much pressure on them, and they tried to overthrow the government, as you know. I right. mean, the coup by the cousin of the king, was definitely staged by a constellation of Israel, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, and their clients were the one involved, and they have been punishing them, and uh, uh, as a result, the Jordanian people are suffering, and this is why Jordan and Syria opened up and resumed relations, and now Lebanon is now being part of an economic plan that would bring uh, gas into Lebanon. Yeah, because they are trying a breathing room, because it is clear that they are all suffering from sinister, cruel Gulf policies uh, in order to starve the people to rise against their government that America does not like or Saudi Arabia does not like and so on. Uh, so, th and, and that is the future of the region. Our future is tied together. The people of Palestine and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon, our economic planning will not work and will not prosper if we do not coordinate together. It is, it is destiny. And it is in the economic interest. We have much more in common than European Union countries that coordinate together. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is foolish that we don't. And the only reason why we haven't done that, the only reason why Arab unity has been foiled over the decade 
is because the West conspired against it. Mm -hmm. And the West and the West relied on Saudi Arabia to propagate an alternative message of Islamic identity as a, and that's Islamic fundamentalism and the fanaticism that was spread by Saudi Arabia around the world. Right. And you know, you were one of the, I think, earliest, let's say, controversial voices on Arab satellite TV back when Al Jazeera was like the lone independent voice. But now it seems like every town in like Iraq, every political party in Lebanon, every opposition group in Syria, every capitalist family in the Arab world, they all have their own satellite TV networks. Right. So my question for you is how has the Arab media scene changed and is it for the better? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I used to be a frequent guest on some of the Arabic TV satellite stations, mainly namely Al Jazeera, Al Jadid, and others. Uh, Al Manar, as you know, I, I used to appear on it, but it became later declared as a terrorist organization. Look at Israel and the United States, how they think, huh? They can declare, they can declare a human rights organization a terrorist organization. They can de de declare a TV station a terrorist organization. So I have not been on Arabic TV for 10 years. I mean, uh, one, I don't want to. And I'll tell you my experience with Al Jazeera. I used to appear on Jazeera quite a bit, and uh, they had me on many times. But I noticed something different change by 2010, 2011. I could see something was changing. And I could see Al Jazeera because I've been there to their offices three times. And the last time I was there, it was very clear. An Islamist, Muslim brother-oriented people mm -hmm. have taken over, as opposed to the secular Arab nationalists that I knew who were in charge early years of Al Jazeera. Right. Uh, but uh, last time I was on Al Jazeera after Bahrain, uh, I was on after US ambassador of some sort or an American official, and they allowed him to be on by himself. And you can look it up on YouTube. So I appeared after him and they tried to interrupt me and I was furious. I said, you allowed a US propagandist to appear by himself without any interruption. And you're trying to interrupt me when I'm criticizing the Qatari government about its foreign policy. I will not sit in my chair if you do not give me the time. And it was like heated and that was the last time. But this is what's interesting, Anya. In 2017, was it 17 when uh, Saudi Arabia declared siege on Qatar and I they started so. the war? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 17? That was right. 2017, yeah. So after seven years of not being on their airways on, so they contacted me because, because they had a good relation with Saudi Arabia all these years and 2017, Suddenly, Saudi Arabia declared war on Qatar, right? So they called me and they said, we would like to host you as a guest again and so on. And I said to them very clearly, I said, look, now your relationship with Saudi Arabia are sour and they declared war on you. But I refuse to be a tool in your campaigns and in your foreign policy. Pass on to wow. somebody else. I don't want to be part of it. So I have not been part of that. How has the media changed? It has become almost to a suffocating degree under the thumb of Saudi Arabia and UAE, and they banned from Arabs. There are two main satellite uh, networks, and they are one is by Egypt, one by Saudi Arabia, and they rooted out all the ones that support resistance to Israel. So America decides. I mean, the Director General of Al Jazeera told me that the American government supplies Al Jazeera officially every every month or every two weeks. I forgot with a detailed critique of everything that airs on Al Jazeera, and they wow. asked them. And they asked them to revise terminology and guess and all that stuff. To that extent, they are involved. So uh, one is Saudi UAE had and two, the proliferation of local media. So they don't want us to think pan-Arab. They want mm -hmm. Arabs to think in their quarters, in their alley, to have narrow concern and not pan-Arab concern. Thirdly, the phenomenon of billionaires' own media. We have them in Lebanon, we have them in the Arab world, and so on. And they basically want to send a message of capitalism, Western hegemony, and of course, support for normalization with Israel. Oh, 100%. And it's amazing, you know, sometimes I think that Leb the Lebanese have like an overinflated sense of how important they are because they're such an over, they're so ever overrepresented by media. There's so many channels here. Like it's a country of just 6 million people. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's just like, but every little thing that happens here gets so much attention that it's people here think that they're like an international issue sometimes when they're not even. It's funny. And, and if we ironic. were to 
if we were to classify the political orientation and mission of all the Lebanese media, the printed one, the websites, as well as the TV satellite stations, we will say 5% to 95. 9%, 95% are owned, controlled by Westerners, Gulf mm -hmm. governments, and wealthy billionaires, and the rest are aligned with the uh, with the uh, resistance axis, and and they are really bad, by the way. In and in and there's still and the resistance is still strong. That's what's that's what's funny right. about that is despite this, that's true. That's true. all this that's true. money. That's true. So I just have a couple more questions for you, just to bring it back to Lebanon to really end sure. on is. I wanted to ask you, and this is kind of a cliche question that we hear now, but since you were in Lebanon during the civil war, I know you're not here now, but you hear what the situation is like. So I'm just curious, you know, when you hear about the, the there are similar shortages and like the issue of like migration of people are leaving right now, the current crisis, of course, is much less bloody, but at the same time, it's, it's very bad. So I, I guess, how do you think this crisis compares to the 1980s? Well, I would tell you this. Uh, my friends who lived through the Civil War and who are still there, they tell me now the living situation is the worst it has ever been. The PLO really helped us a lot. The PLO had a lot of money. And there was always circulation of U.S. dollars in the Lebanese market. There was a lot of buying and selling. And that kept the living conditions much better than it could have been otherwise. Also, people were extremely innovative and very enterprising in finding alternatives uh, for importing wheat or uh, getting uh, food from other countries and so on. So people always managed. Like, I remember times when there was water shortages and the bread shortages, but people managed. The worst part was the Israeli siege of Beirut in 82, when the Israeli army and the surrogate Lebanese forces thugs used to search cars and to throw under their feet whatever bread they found that was trying to enter West Beirut. That's how cruel they were. But fortunately, Israeli army soldiers and Lebanese forces thugs are extremely bribable. And I remember the PLO, <laughs> and I remember the PLO would pay them a lot of money and we would get uh, smuggled in a lot of things that was needed, including surprisingly arms that was needed inside West Beirut. Wow. So the situation economically is really the worst. However, I don't think that there is an appetite for civil war. The party that is most capable, the party was most capable of igniting a civil war in 75 was the Falange. And they did. The party that is most capable of igniting a civil war today is Hezbollah. And it doesn't want it. It avoids it at all costs for a variety of reasons. So that's one. Two, outside powers that want to, uh, in, in, in 75, there were many outside powers who wanted a civil war against the PLO and the Lebanese left. Western powers, Gulf countries, Arab reaction, and so on. That's not the case today. I would say the only countries that really want a civil war in Lebanon today would be Israel, Saudi Arabia, and UAE. Mm -hmm. They want to drag Hezbollah into a sideshow to distract their energies and resources. But Hezbollah, I think, is aware of that danger. And that explains their very careful avoidance of anything that would slide towards a civil war. Uh, yeah. Thirdly, I think there is enough information about the horrors of the civil war that hopefully younger generation are able to see how damaging it was and so on. And fourthly, in 75, people like myself, I was 15 years old, you could dream about change from this war. And we had progressive parties, we have the Palestinian, we had George Habash, who do we have today? I mean, we don't have a dreamy kind of agenda. We have today sectarian political parties, parties that are religious affiliated. So if there is a civil war, everybody knows it's going to be Muslim versus Sh Christian, Sunni versus Shiite, Druze versus... Sh so it's going to be like that. And a war like that, by definition, is going to be indiscriminate and horrific. And for that reason, I take it upon myself, even though I'm not a pacifist, obviously, I always warn against civil war in Lebanon. And I always urge people like, express yourself, talk about social uh, in social media about everything, but do not use discourse that is sectarian that could really agitate or intensify the climate of civil strife in Lebanon. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and then my last question for you, and it's kind of a big one, but I think it's good to end on, is 
when you look at the problems in Lebanon, it seems to be facing two separate crises that are often, I think, conflated. Like there's the political crisis, right? You have this bankrupt political elite uh, that's facing increasing questions about their legitimacy. And then you have the second crisis, which is the economic crisis due to the criminal mismanagement of the banking sector, which you will talked about why that's the case earlier. But can you really separate these two or are they related? Well, uh, they are related by virtue of the fact that those who are responsible for our financial collapse are tied to an outside political agenda. I mean, Riyad Salemi is not a mere governor of the central bank. He is somebody who was the implementer of the U.S. Treasury Department sanctioned list. I mean, Riyad Salemi was the ears and eyes of the U.S. Treasury in order to prevent and to uh, basically report all funding for all resistance groups, not only in Lebanon, but outside of Lebanon. So for that reason, there is so much heavy investment by the U.S. in him. So you see how the domestic is tied. Take somebody like Walid Jublak, one of the most corrupt figures in Lebanese history. I mean, this guy is very closely tied to Western agendas and Gulf agendas. And he was very closely tied to the Syrian intelligence during the domination of Lebanon. Jumblad became brave against Syria after it withdrew its forces from Lebanon in 2005. He became loud in criticism in the last year or so. Uh, just the same thing, Rafiq Hariri never criticized Syria, in fact. I mean, yet he is now taken as a symbol. So I think all the dimensions of Lebanese conflict have never been separate. They are all intertwined. And they are all intertwined by virtue of the heavy, heavy, heavy-handed presence of Western powers inside the country. I mean, take the British embassy and the American embassy. They really run the Lebanese army today. The Lebanese army does not answer to the, uh, I'm writing an article for, for, for this week about that for Al-Akhbar. The Lebanese army does not answer to, to the president. They answer to the embassies, two embassies. And the two ambassadors of Britain and the United States, they go on, on tours of secret military bases. I mean, who does that? I mean, this is a country that should have a modicum of sovereignty, but it is violated by Israel and also by the Americans and the Westerners. And yet, and yet, Western powers and Gulf media dare to say Lebanon is under Iranian <laughs> domination. I mean, what's funny about that is Lebanon is under Iranian domination, and yet Iran is criticized round the clock in all TV. And if one minister, as just happened today, criticizes the Saudi UAE war on Lebanon, there is a whole charade of condemnation and humiliation and apologies requested and so on. Exactly. Actually, what you're talking about today, the Lebanese information minister had yeah. lightly criticized Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen and right. the Saudis like completely lost it and they're demanding an right. apology, but we're under Iranian occupation, apparently. <laughs> On right. that note, um, Assad Abu Khalil, political science professor at California State University. Where can everyone follow your incredible commentary? I know that you write mostly in Arabic for Al Akhbar, but you also write for other outlets as well. I write bi weekly column for Consortium News, and I also am very active on Twitter. And I was expelled. I was expelled from Facebook. And Whoa. That, oh, yes, I, I have been that. expelled since last April. And I hold a strong grudge against Mark Zuckerberg and those Zionists who are behind this expulsion of mine. Hopefully, was we'll have new media that would, uh, you know, uh, liberate us from the domination of these American big tech companies. Absolutely. And they do play a huge role in the Middle East, too, as well. There's so totally. much communication that takes place over totally. Facebook. Totally. Um, it's kind of frightening that they can just like uh, take people or remove people whenever they feel like it without warning. But thank you so much for coming on and spending this an hour and a half discussing the issues in Lebanon. I really appreciate it. With pleasure, Rania. 